Hi there, so it's two o'clock and we've got about a half of our attendees are in. Um, we see people coming in still, so we're going to wait just another minute or so and then we'll get started and have a slide up that's talking about what we're going to go over. So um, I also have a slide, I'm going to go forward one slide that talks about um, a little bit how to use the system, so I'll leave that up for just a minute. Uh, or two while we watch people come in. We've got about 50 out of our, I think, 83 registered attendees in the room. So we're just going to give another minute or two and then we'll get started. So uh, it's 201. We're going to start here in just a minute. I, I had hi John, I'm waving at you. Uh, this is Sloan, and uh, I heard that my audio had gone off. I had myself muted um, while I was poking around on my computer. So it's 202, and uh, I think we'll get started. I have a slide up right now that just talks a little bit about how you control your interface to be part of this webinar. And to be honest, you may all know more about this software than I do, but um, we're going to be taking questions from anyone with questions, so please type them into the question box. Um, because we have so many attendees in this webinar, we have everyone muted, but if you, um, you, know, you really want to speak instead of typing, I totally get that. So you're welcome to raise your hand um, using that little hand icon, and if you do that, then uh, we'll unmute you and then we can have an actual conversation instead of this one-way conversation. So I'm going to just go back to the first slide and talk about this for just a second while we have a few more people coming in. So um, everything special districts need to know about online compliance. So um, this is our, our index of the things we'll be talking about today and I hope it's going to be valuable for you. Uh, we've got some great handouts. Uh, I think quite a few of you got those already. Um, if you haven't, um, they're actually in here in the handouts section, and I'll be sending them as a follow-up as well. Um, we're recording this as well, so if you know somebody it might be handy for, um, we will give you access to that recording afterwards, and you'll be able to share it with whomever you'd like. Um, the one thing I will say is that this talk is, is um, aimed at special districts in general. So what we won't be talking about are things specific to different types of special districts. So for example, the consumer confidence reports for a water agency, we didn't include that in here because it's just water agency specific. So this is all the kind of general stuff that you need to be watching out for. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I already showed you this slide. I don't know that we have anybody new in who didn't get to see it already. Um, raise your hand if you want to uh, be unmuted and put your questions right into the question box. Um, one of the things, sometimes if we get a lot of questions, we don't always get to them right away. So just know that if you do ask a question and we haven't answered it by the time we're at the end, um, we'll send a follow-up with uh, kind of a Q&A attached to it. And uh, we'll also try to leave a little room at the end for questions, but please throw them in there as they come up for you so that you don't forget. All right. So just to give you a little background on who we are, so I'm Sloan, and I'm here with Mac. He's going to be handling the questions, and uh, Mac is our CEO of Digital Deployment, and I'm the lead on Streamline Division. So we've been around for a long time, building a lot of websites. Uh, we've, we've worked with a lot of agencies, uh, especially locally in California, and uh, my background is actually in special districts. I have a fire background and a small local government background from Calaveras County. So when we started looking at different ways we could make a difference in the world, Special districts kind of became a focus because a small local government seems pretty underserved. So that's why we work in this space and we work with some pretty great partners too. 
So this is, this is, well, I'm just a Schoolhouse Rock fan, but this talk actually originally is, this is based on a talk that Dylan, who's a lobbyist over at CSDA, and I put together for a couple of the conferences, the CSDA conferences. Um, so it's just a little expanded from that. He was amazing getting all this information together. So the first thing I want to talk about is open data. So this is kind of a big deal. It's AB169. And I mean, I'm not going to sit here and read all the slides to you because I'm sure you can all read faster than I can read out loud. But uh, the thing about this is that this is now the standard. So they've got this down as kind of the bedrock that we're all going to point to as we start talking about new laws that are going to come out. And so 169 talks about what open data means. And, you know, the guidelines, which I'll, I'll explain, um, basically say that you need your content, your open data content, to be machine readable and searchable and, and structured in a certain way. So, you know, my first thing I say is just, you know, if it doesn't fit the requirements to be called open data, then just don't call it open data. Um, you know, if you have an open data portal, a lot of people are using that phrase right now. And um, sometimes the content is actually open data according to 169, but sometimes it's not. Um, so just be careful with that. And, you know, maybe just avoid the phrase in writing if you're putting content on your site that you're not sure of. I thought it'd be helpful if I pulled this slide in. This is a new slide. Um, I'm a little concerned about this area lately because everybody keeps throwing around this idea of machine readable. Um, it's one of the phrases that's in AB169. And, um, you know, a lot of things that are human readable are not machine readable. So, you know, your typical HTML files, your typical Word files, things like that, um, PDFs. You know, um, in our own platform, our PDFs are searchable because they're text-based. But by default, they aren't actually machine readable, not by this definition. So it's going to be interesting to see as the laws progress and things get better defined, you know, if they're going to actually put a definition in to 169 of what machine readable reads means exactly or not. So we'll keep an eye on that. Next thing is Section 508 compliance. So this is actually a federal law. And if you read the law, um, because you're super bored or um, <laughs> want to be more bored. Um, but if you were to read this law, it's uh, pretty long, and it talks about all the different things we need to do to accommodate people with disabilities. And one of those is that your website needs to be accessible with assistive technology. So for example, a JAWS screen reader, things like that. And that really, that has a lot to do with keeping you out of trouble. And so if you do actually read the law, um, it, it technically only applies to agencies that receive federal dollars. So I've talked to quite a few people that say, well, you know, our agency doesn't get any money from the federal government, so we don't have to really worry about this. But the truth is you do have to worry about it because just about anybody is, and, you know, especially this is California, so you can get sued for just about anything. But, um, you know, there have been all kinds of agencies that have been sued successfully over Section 508 noncompliance, um, even Target.com which is Mac's example all the time, Target was sued successfully, and they probably settled. But in any case, um, you really need to make sure you're 508 compliant. Um, you know, the platform we work with, the software you work with is, there are some great testing suites out there where you can test for it. The handouts that we give with all the details give you some options, and then you can also just search for it. So the next thing to come back to California is the Public Records Act. and so. Um, I can't imagine there's anyone on this call who doesn't know more about the Public Records Act than I do in general, so I won't talk about the act itself, but I do want to talk about a couple of online requirements, and these are fairly new. So SB 272, this was actually uh, passed into law in January. Compliance was required by July 1st. Um, I hope everybody on this call is paying uh, close attention to this because they're starting to look for these catalogs now. Um, for a while, it was a little bit of just an exercise, and, you know, it was kind of like, um, it's always, not always clear what the purpose of it is, so a lot of agencies just weren't taking this very seriously, but they actually are getting, um, the last agencies we saw were the Electronic Frontier Foundation and a couple others had people actually actively searching for these catalogs. Um, it's, it's a, uh, personally, I, I believe it's a pretty confusing law. Um, so what we did is we created a free tool to help with compliance, and we put webinars on about SB 272 in particular. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, um, but I will say that if there's anybody on this call who hasn't created their catalog yet, and you know you want a little guidance or you'd like to talk more about it, 
please just reply to the follow-up email that I send along. Um, I'll be sending an email to everyone and you know you can just get a hold of me and we can talk about SB272. Um, basically our software helps you inventory your systems to decide if they need to be included in your catalog and then to publish your catalog itself. Um, so here's an example of one of my favorites, Yuva Sutter, and a little arrow to the enterprise system catalog. So um, something to know about SB272 is that you're required to post it in a quote-unquote prominent location on your website. Um, I, I personally feel like most of the visitors to your website are never going to go looking for that, so I wouldn't suggest you put it on your home page. Um, I'm a big fan of having a transparency page and just including it there. Um, here's just the actual catalog itself from Yuba Sutter. So this is just what our system spits out. Now, of course, you can also do a spreadsheet. You know, you don't have to use anybody else's software. You definitely don't have to pay anybody to do this. Um, you can do it yourself and put your spreadsheet up on your website and call it a day. Um, keep in mind that this has to be updated annually. The law does not say whether or it, whether it's every July 1 or whether it's annually after the day you first put it up or whether it's annual per your fiscal year. The law is just not clear. So I, you know, I think one of the things we've been telling people is when it comes to SB 272, I think trying goes a long way. So as long as you're trying to do your inventory and trying to get it up on your website, and you know, you're making an attempt. Um, you know, I really don't think you're going to be able to get in any trouble. There are some exemption, exemptions for security things, but something to keep in mind about SB 272 is that if you think about the Public Records Act, th this is confusing because they tucked this law into the Public Records Act and therefore they don't have to reimburse for the cost to comply, which is great for the state, but it makes it a little confusing because if you imagine it if I were a public agency and I use QuickBooks for all of my billing of my customers and somebody came and said, I want your QuickBooks file, I would say, no, that's a privacy issue and so I don't have to comply with that under the PRA. Well, that does not mean that QuickBooks would not need to be included in my catalog. Like in this example, they've gotten into it QuickBooks because the rules about SB 272 are a little different than they are about the actual Public Records Act. So you may have to disclose your system even if you wouldn't share the information that's in it. So it's a little tricky, a little bit tricky. Um, but now I'll move on to some good news. That's why my little bill looks happy this time. So AB 2853 just passed, and this one's kind of exciting. Um, I'm just excited that, that something that's helpful to local agencies um, got through. So this basically says that you can put anything that's requested by Public Records Act, if you put it on your website, then when somebody asks for it, you can just point to your website and say, there it is, it's right there. So, you know, it's kind of hard to say how much money this can save or how much staff time it can save in the long run. But the reality is, is that if you're not having to stop and make copies and meet people at the front counter and take all these phone calls and do things like that, um, my guess is that it might, you know, be a significant amount of time for a larger agency. Um, you know, talk about post often requested records to your site and point people there. Uh, important to note that if they don't have internet access or they say they can't access your site, you still have to provide printed copies. Um, this is just an example of, you know, I put your records right there on your website. So your, your compensation report, your financial transaction reports, all those different kinds of things, put them on your website and then make it very clear how people can make public record acts requests. And one of the things that I really suggest that every agency do is put a web form on your site to make it really easy for your visitors to ask for them. Because if you do that and you've received a web form from them being on your website, then they really can't say that they can't access the internet since they access the internet to get to the site, to get to the form, to fill it out. So then you can turn around and just point to your site and say, hey, thanks so much for your email. Here's a link to all the pages that have the information you're looking for. So I guess a small thing, but I'll take the little wins. Um, so. So we we're just talking and talking and not having anybody out there. Um, so the Brown Act. So, um, you know, I'm sure, again, you all know more about this than I do. Uh, very familiar with making sure your agendas are posted. Um, one of the things that's important, and I am surprised how often I see this, is that if you have a website, that deadline applies to putting those on your website as well. So uh, one of the things we really want to do is make sure our people don't get in trouble and there's just so much more scrutiny of agencies and local government lately that it's really important if you have a website that you're putting your agendas on the website, um, not just on your local whatever and the same deadline applies. So, you know, this is one of the ways we're solving this. And uh, 
I'm going to say, you know, we build website software for local agencies, but that's not what this is about. But I am using Streamline Web as an example a few times throughout this because, you know, these are real problems for people. And so it's just fun to show, you know, why we're working in this area and how we're solving it. So, you know, agenda reminders, another super low cost way of doing it is just to put a reminder in your phone, you know, or on your desktop and your calendar, you know, whatever you need to do, but make sure those agendas are getting up online before your meetings. And then this is just a plug for something that I feel very strongly about. Um, you know, the old school way of doing things is to post your meetings somewhere on a calendar to have another page that says agendas and post all your agendas there and then to have yet a third page that says minutes and post your minutes there. But I feel very strongly that if someone is coming to look for agendas or minutes, you know, it's all based around the unifying principle of that actual meeting and the meeting date. So regardless of whether or not you use Streamline or whether you use your own system, if your meetings include the agendas and the minutes when they're available, then the public can always find everything in one spot. And that's important because typically if they're looking for an agenda or looking for the minutes, then they're looking to find information about some subject that happened at the meeting. So here's uh, not such a great new, new law. Um, CSDA actually, um, well, CSDA, CSAC, and the League of Cities, they, they fought this one and uh, didn't, didn't make it. Um, so you're going to have to post a link to the actual agenda, the most recent agenda, even if the meeting is passed, on your home page. Now, they got it pushed out till 2019, which is great, so you've got some time. Um, the, the other thing I would say is that if you use an agenda management system that has all of your agendas in it, you can actually just link to that on your home page instead of the agenda itself. As long as the agenda, the most recent agenda, is at the top of the agenda management system. So, so you know, you can go either way, but one way or another, um, just, you know, make sure that before 2019 you're ready to do that. Um, again, to talk about one of the things that we do at Streamline, so we've had the next three upcoming meetings showing up automatically on the home page um, for a long time. That's one of the things we thought was really important to build into the software um, because of the meeting management dashboard. However, the agendas currently do not pull through to the home page. So, you know, we know that we're just going to have to build into the software, first of all, the agenda coming through to the home page before 2019, which I'm pretty sure we can manage, but also that the past meetings stay on that home page until there's another agenda available because it is the most recent agenda, not just an upcoming agenda. So, important thing to know. So, the financial transaction report, um, I know everyone's probably familiar with doing this, and Basically, our suggestion is that if, if you're filling out forms that the state is requiring you to fill out, then just put them on your website. So again, even if it's not required, which for this one it is, um, still might save you a little bit of trouble when it comes to those Public Records Act requests. And again, compensation report. So this one, um, you can, instead of putting the report on your page if you want to, you can list, link to the public pay website instead, which makes your life a little bit easier. Just add a quick link to public pay and then that's persistent. You don't have to update it over and over again when you have a new compensation report. And I want to remind everybody just to ask questions if you have any. Just keep them coming. Um, so this is an example of, you know, my Acme Municipal because I'm a big uh, Roadrunner Wiley Coyote fan. So my demo site um, where I've put those reports right there in the main section of, of a landing page for financial reports. So again, it's the same example I gave you before, but again, if people are asking for these things, you can simply point to your website. You don't have to go, um, go sending them to them or uh, printing them out and making copies and doing all that kind of stuff. So uh, this was great. This was a win this year. Um, it was a new compensation report, and um, especially when it comes to special districts, this was aimed at local government, but I mean, it's just kind of funny because very few special districts have board members that have, you know, get vacation time um, or, or things like that. Um, so anyway, it was going to be another, another uh, report that was going to be required, and it got vetoed, and they say that it might be back. Um, they may try again. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I feel so strongly 
that um, we work closely with the agencies that are helping advocate for local government like CSDA, like CSAC, like the League of Cities, um, because they push back on things like this and then you don't have a duplicate report that you have to do. This one actually, like I said, got vetoed, so it had passed. It was ready to go and they were able to get um, the governor to veto it, which is great. So Google's mobile friendly update. So uh, this is mobile Geddon. Um, and it's not that recent, actually. I think it's been about a year now. But um, they, I, you know, they pretty much control search. And they changed their algorithm a while back so that agencies that have websites that are not mobile friendly may not show up in search results when somebody is searching on a mobile device. So my example for that is always that you know, as a mother, I'm at work and I want to go to the park with my son after work and I go look in Google for my local recreation and park district, which happens to be in Rancho Cordova. And uh, I could find it and say, okay, great, I'm going to take him there and we'll play soccer. I actually don't play soccer, but we'll go there and do something. And then, um, you know, we'll go pick Chris up and I go, oh, take my phone and find that park again because I can't remember where it was. And he could do a search for that same exact search phrase and that park may not show up in the results at all. So it's just really important to make sure that your site is, is mobile friendly and or, and or responsive. Um, and there are a lot of solutions to that. You know, Streamline is, but we're not the only one. WordPress has themes that are responsive. Um, Drupal has themes that are responsive. I mean, there are a lot of platforms. And you can test for responsiveness at that URL. I should have mentioned this sooner. If anybody's madly writing that down, um, I'm going to share these slides with you so you don't have to take notes. <laughs> I should have said that really early. Um, so you don't have to take a lot of crazy notes. Yeah, I should have said that earlier. Um, and uh, also in the handouts, there are all of these links too. So all this information that I'm sharing with you, um, I really just wanted to talk to you today, but you could have just looked at the handouts. I'm just kidding. I'm covering a little bit more that's in the handouts. Um, so here's another example of Mobile Friendly Matters, just a way for um, a website to reflow into a mobile device. Now something that's really important about that search update is that um, tablets are considered mobile devices too. And so, you know, it's easy to think, well, somebody doesn't necessarily do all that searching on a phone, but there are quite a few people now who um, basically use their tablet instead of a desktop. So it's just important to know. So I'm getting through this super fast. You, oh. you just did get a question about responsive. Oh. Do you want me to answer it? I'll answer it. Hold on. OK. Um, oh, by a responsive theme. So let me go. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to make sure I get these questions as they come in. So the exa an example of a responsive theme is a theme that kind of resizes itself as a browser gets smaller. So technically, there are these things called breakpoints. Um, and uh, where as the, the screen gets smaller, things start to stack. So, you know, on the left would be an example on this slide of the desktop version of my Acme Municipal Utility District website. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that on a smaller device, it's come down into a single column and the quick links have all stacked and it gets what we call the hamburger menu above our mission. So, um, it, you know, then you click on that and that would then drop down. And um, since we are going to have extra time, once I get through the slides, I can pull up one of our sites and just squish it down and show you, too. Okay, and then, um, <laughs> so I know this is so great getting the questions. I'm like, I wish I could talk to everybody, but there's just too many people on this. Um, and yes, you're welcome, and yes, we'll make everything available after the presentation. And, you know, it's our job here is to be as helpful as we can. So. Um, Content best practices, there are some interesting things around this. Um, we, on the digital deployment side, we do pretty big website projects and we do an awful lot of consulting and we do um, a lot of discovery and information architecture and all of these thousands of dollars worth of work. You know, and often the, what we're really trying to get at is that very first line, like what are your visitors looking for? Um, it's very common for us to see um, not just agencies, but private entities too, and institutions and our nonprofits uh, try to build a website for themselves. So it's all about what they think, and it's organized by their departments and the way they believe people look for information. But you know, there's a couple things you can do without really spending any money at all to really think about your audience. One of them is you could just ask a few of them. 
So you can, you can, we do this, you know, you do user testing, you ask your grandma and you ask your husband or your partner or your son or your daughter or somebody you know or some of your citizens that you happen to be also friends with, just anybody to go take a look at your website, see how it works for them, what do they use it for most often. Um, you know, you can do surveys, we're actually partners with FlashVote, they're a great, great service where you can do these quick little voting things and ask people about what they care about. You can do, you know, survey monkey things, whatever you'd like, but, you know, really try to make sure you understand what they need from you because, you know, local agencies, one of the things, one of the reasons that I'm working in this area and love it so much is because it's so service oriented. You know, everyone is so busy doing their jobs and providing the services that they know their citizens need. But you have to think about your website the exact same way because it's also providing those services or at least the information about those services. So again, homepage content, target your main audience. It's one of the reasons, that, again, why I say don't put your enterprise system catalog on your homepage because it's very unlikely that any of your actual visitors care about that. Uh, frequent requests for information, post that information on your site. Um, you know, not that calls aren't nice, but you know, if a lot of people prefer to find information online instead of calling. So get that on your site too. Public Record Acts request for information, again, that new law, so yay, put that there. Um, and Google Analytics, uh, so you can just go to google.com slash analytics and sign up and um, depending on what platform you're using, it may be easy or it may be a little harder, but it just gives you a little code to plug right in and then you can see exactly how people are engaging with your website. You can also see how many of those users are coming from mobile devices. So that may tell you whether or not being mobile friendly is all that important. Um, you can learn, oh gosh, regions and demographics and all kinds of crazy stuff. It's really, really helpful and again, it's free. Um, the navigation, like I said, a lot of people often organize their websites based on their departments. And um, an example of this is uh, I've been working with the town of Cary in North Carolina lately and in testing their website, one of the things that's always clear is that nobody can find out where to pay their water bill or how to sign up for water because those are done through the finance department and there's no mention of it on the water pages. So if you go to the water landing page, it talks about how they treat their water and how important water is and <laughs> it talks about conservation and all this other great stuff where people were just like, I just want to pay my bill. They can't figure out how to do it because they're not thinking to go to the finance page. So really important to just think like a visitor when you worry about your nav terms and setting all that up. Um, the bite-sized information, this is really important. Um, you know, we just finished doing some online user testing on that same website I was just talking about. And one of the things that we see all the time is people are scanning down a page to look for what they're looking for. So your information needs to be in short little bursts, even if there are links to more, you know, where somebody can click off and go find more about what they're looking for. Having those landing pages really easy to scan is important. The other reason it's important is because, again, back to section 508, um, the JAWS readers, they only read like 175 characters, I believe, of, of any bit of a piece of information. So they are not going to read a huge teaser to a visitor who's visually impaired. And so they're going to be missing out on a whole lot of that information. Again, so this is something that I just kind of added before the last talk. Um, we do a lot of work in this area. So again, if, they, if you have any questions about this or you'd like some guidance or whatever, please just follow up. Uh, with us after the after the webinar. Um, here's just an example of something that you could see in Google Analytics. Um, I, there's a couple slides in here where I'm going to use um, regional sanitation, Sacramento Area Regional Sanitation District as an example because they're one of our digital deployment clients and they're just amazing in the way that they communicate. Um, they're really, their content's good and um, this is just an example from you know, a day in the life of their website. But you can just learn an awful lot from Google Analytics about how people are engaging with your website. So again, I just keep beating this in my little boom. I was just so excited about this when this law passed. I don't know, I, I, I get um, a little frustrated. I think the freedom of information, of course, is very important, um, but I also think that it it's, can be burdensome on agencies if journalists are hitting you with a lot of requests just to see if you're going to comply. And while you should comply, and of course, you know, everyone needs to have the information that's accessible via this act, 
it just doesn't make any sense for it to be a real burden, especially for smaller agencies. So, um, so I just am really excited about AB 2853, and I really want to encourage people to try and take advantage of that. Um, it's going to be hard to get used to because you're probably used to um, you're used to just making copies or whatever. And I'm getting the question symbol. Okay. So um, we have a question from the audience. If our homepage has a drop-down link um, to the most recent board agenda, does that meet the needs of this new law, or does the agenda itself have to be on the homepage? Oh, my gosh. Okay, thank you so much for asking that question, and I apologize for missing this. It cannot be in a contextual link. So I apologize. That is such a good question, and I should have covered it. So um, it cannot be in the menu. It cannot be in a contextual link, so maybe a drop down of quick links or your regular navigation. It has to be literally on the home page. So I, ho I hope that's clear. Yeah, on the home page. Great question. So, gosh, my same example of, of, of how to comply well with 2853 and take advantage of it. So, again, um, you know, the more you can make Public Records Act requests easier, but electronic, I think the better we're all going to be in the long run. So getting close towards the end of the presentation now, so email communication, this is really interesting. Um, we do a lot of email campaigns, and many of you are here probably because you got an email from us, and we struggle over this ourselves, and we always wish that you know, our, our subject lines were better, and we want to make sure that we're really on target, and we struggle not to have too many messages in each message because we have so many things we want to tell everyone about. Um, it's really important if you're doing regular email cam campaigns to think about the intention of each and to keep them focused because none of us have a whole lot of time on our hands to spend reading um, extraneous things. So just a couple of quick bullets. Um, anytime you can do things on a schedule so that people are used to hearing from you and you have something to say that's valuable. Um, you don't want to be on a schedule and just be spamming people with no good reason. But, you know, if you can look at your agency and say, well, you know, we tend to have some big changes that happen about every so often, then we'll send a quarterly or we'll send a monthly. Um, again, clear intention so you're not muddying it up with, you know, here's five messages about different things. And then targeted information when possible. So having, you know, email lists where people can sign up specifically for what they want. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to get better about here is letting people sign up just for updates on legislative things like this because one of the questions we've gotten a couple of times when we've given this talk is okay this is a lot and there's always these new laws how are we supposed to even know um, we hear that a lot around SB 272 um, because it's kind of hard like how do you keep on top of this and so you know I have a couple of suggestions about that but one of the things that I've tried to do is like well why don't we start an email list and let people sign up just to get that kind of information um, and yeah, and the branded emails that have your voice, um, it, it's interesting. So I think that there's often this view that unless you have a big budget and a lot of time to spend as you know, communication specialists and all of this, that there's really no way to stay on brand or on voice. And I think that that's just not true. Most of the agencies that I've worked with and even the smaller special districts have a mission statement. And most of the districts that I work with are so mission driven and so service oriented. And so that's your voice. So when you're writing these communications, write them from that place of being of service, and they will sound like you, which is great. Um, one of the things I did want to talk about, and I'll use Regional SAN again as an example, because they're a client, and I happen to live in their district. So Regional Sanitation, there was, and if there are sanitation people, people from sanitation districts on this call, you'll know what I'm talking about more than I do. But there was a law that passed that is going to require um, wastewater to be treated to a higher level than ever before. So it's like a tertiary treatment. So I, I'm waving my hands around and looking at Mac. Um, but basically, their current system for treating will not meet these new requirements. And they're going to be, you know, in place by 2019 or whenever, 2017 maybe. So they started working on this Echo Water Project. And um, in their Echo Water Project, on their, they started talking about this well, well in advance. And they did mailers, which can be expensive for smaller districts, but they also did email campaigns to all of their customers. And so as a customer, I have been hearing about this for so long, for so long that I already know, I already know 
that my rates are going to go up. Sorry, I just lost my display, so I have no idea what I'm seeing here. Um, that my rates are going to go up. And I've been getting all this messaging, and all of it has been um, very short. As you see in that message, it's not a long diatribe about the history. Um, it's not trying to cover too many things at once. It simply tells me about the rates. And so, but that's not the first message that ever came. We're trying to get the display back now. There it is. All right. So, um, so this is one of the later messages that came. And they post it to their website and they do all those kinds of things. Oh, sorry. I think you guys aren't seeing screen two. There we go. Now we're back. Sorry about that. Apparently, YouTube decided it wanted my computer for some reason. Um, so anyway, not to belabor this, but by the time I got this message, I had the entire background. I knew why it was happening. I knew exactly what was happening and when. And so, oh, and it's going to be completed in 2001, 2023. So it's really great to use email as a way to keep in touch with your people and let them know what you're up to and not to wait until you just have bad news to tell them. You know, one of the things we see often is um, agencies who will only email about a rate increase or, you know, when there's a meeting that they think is going to be contentious, they'll really reach out to people or something like that. And I think it's really important to develop, um, you know, a communication and a relationship at way, well ahead of those kinds of messages. I just think they're a lot more impactful. Um, so again, back to this question of how do you keep on top of this stuff? Um, CSDA is, is a great resource. Um, you know, this, this presentation is aimed at special districts, really, because that's where we've given our talks. But um, if you're from another agency, it's like any of your peer agencies, any of the, any of the um, associations that are really watching out for local government. So um, the California Special District Association, uh, CSAC, the League of Cities, all of those people. ILG is also the, the um, Institute for Local Government. They're another one of our clients and they are just amazing, really, really mission driven, really working towards good governance and um, a little more on the side of education and things like that than advocacy, but they really keep on top of everything as well. Um, again, you can subscribe for our mail list. I did go add a checkbox so that you can just subscribe for these kinds of updates, legislative updates if you want. Um, <laughs> the third bullet, legislative updates, this is, this is um, for the brave. Uh, I, I get keywords, you get to put in keywords and ask them to send you any updates about any laws that uh, may affect those keywords. So an example is I put in the phrase um, website requirements. And I get lots of updates, um, including just about every law that has anything to do with marijuana for some reason. I don't, I'm not really sure why. Um, so, so it is possible. It's there. I don't think it's all that great. I think um, because the filtering doesn't work that well, I tend to tent tune them out. So I just scan. Um, I don't know about the other organizations, but I do know that CSDA, um, which is the California Special District Association, for anybody on this call who, who isn't with a special district, um, CSDA has chapter meetings where they, just different parts of the state, they'll get a group of different organizations together and talk to them, and they're always trying to keep people in touch. Um, legislative days again, and then peer groups, you know, I, I have had quite a few people who have come to us to ask about SB 272 strictly because they heard from someone else who does their job somewhere else, you know, and it could be a totally different kind of agency. So any kind of peer group, stuff like that. And then again, CSDA, I mean, they're working very, very hard. And one of the things I would really encourage anyone who's, who is with a special district who is on this call um, to, you know, please join their grassroots efforts. They worked really hard every, every legislative season to make sure, um, you know, things like that, that duplicate controller's report um, don't, don't fall on your shoulders. There's a lot of different ways you can engage with them. Uh, Dylan is a great contact over there. He helped with this, all the information for this presentation. And then this is us. Um, we have you back. And uh, some of the features that we've built into our software, well, many of the features, most of the features in our software are aimed at local agencies. So uh, lots of stuff to kind of help you stay safe online so you don't have to worry about things like Section 508 compliance or mobile friendliness or all of that. Um, also designed to not have you rely on an outside vendor because that's very difficult when you have things like the Brown Act deadline for agendas. You know, when you're trying to wait on someone else to update your website, that can get a little 
nerve-wracking. Um, and the other thing, too, is that we're able to, because it's software as a service, um, you know, subscription-based, we're able to build build into the platform whatever it takes to um, help you comply. So uh, we also, again, built the free 272 compliance tool. Um, I haven't done a 272 uh, webinar in quite a while because, you know, we hit the deadline and just kind of assumed that everybody was there. And then, you know, we found out that, that everybody isn't. Um, we have about, uh, just about 400 agencies using our tool not just special districts, we've got cities and counties and county agencies and well, laugh goes, I mean just crazy, all different kinds of agencies. Um, so you're welcome to sign up for that and just try it out. It's free forever um, and you can get to it on our website, which I probably should have had up here, but you can get to it on our website by going to getstreamline.com slash SB272. Um, so you can, you can get the free catalog tool from here, but the other thing that you can get to from here that might be really helpful to anyone who hasn't done this yet is you can read the actual bill text from here, and then you can, you can also read the FAQs from our webinars in the past on this. Um, there, there's actually some pretty in-depth information because there were so many questions um, in these webinars. So what we did is we just went through and we just published all of the questions. So I'm just going to sit here and scroll. Lots and lots of questions, lots of answers. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't even remember how many questions and answers. So anyway, we would love to talk to you. You don't have to just try and do it on your own, but um, if, if you do want some help, give us, give us a call or just go sign up online and see what you can find out. And um, that's my last slide. So um, gift of time. I think I just talked too fast. Um, but uh, we really would love to hear any questions you have. Um, if you, anyone who would like us to unmute them, we're happy to, or if you want to type any of your questions in. For those of you who hopefully got everything that you needed from this presentation, um, feel free to hang up and go back about your business and do your thing. And we'll, we'll just stay here for a little bit, just watching for questions. And thank you so much, by the way, for spending your time here. I really appreciate it. I know that everyone is busy, and uh, this is a lot of talking and a lot of information. So thanks again for joining us. Oh, yeah, I'm actually reminding me. We will definitely send that follow-up email and send all the handouts, and uh, you'll have a way to get a hold of us and everything if you have any questions. And I'm going to go quiet now because I'm just going to mute myself so you don't have to keep listening to me chatter. And we'll watch for questions for a while until people start dropping off. So I'm going to unmute um, for a question from Annalise. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, she was asking if I could explain more about being Section 508 compliant. So Section 508, uh, the federal ruling, it, it covers all kinds of things for people with disabilities. So um, everything from wheelchair ramps and the width of bathroom doors and just all of that. But the part of it that talks about technology is all about um, accessibility tools for people who have to use things like screen readers or other assistive devices. So um, if you think about uh, people in a wheelchair who, you know, use, they'll, they'll use their, like their chin to move around in their wheelchair and to get around, and imagine someone with those kind of disabilities trying to navigate a website. So um, Section 508 compliance is, it's, there are tools, and we use them to check our own platform, there are tools that will actually read through your site and make sure that it will work for people using those kinds of devices. 
and again in the handouts we'll have a link to at least one of those scanners and more information about Section 508 compliance too. And then you can always just go Google Section 508 and go read the law itself, which is very long. And like I said, it puts you right to sleep. But <laughs> oh, got a question. Sorry. All right, we have a question from Kim. How does AB 169 um, work when you get a document from a third party that you scan into a PDF? And uh, also, when does it go into effect? Ah, great. Okay, so AB 169, which talks about open data, um, has is already in effect. So basically, though, the trick with that one is, if I go back quickly through all of my slides, the trick with AB 169 is that it only it only defines open data. So it doesn't it doesn't say that anything that you publish on your site has to be open data compliant. It just says that if you do it better match these things, including being machine readable. So, um, so that's the trick with that one. Is it's, it's already in place, but basically it's just a definition so that later laws, for example, if they had said, which they talked about, that um, your SB272 enterprise system catalog had to be AB169 compliant, then those would have had to be machine readable, indexable, searchable, all these other things. Um, but because they didn't put that in the law, um, we, we got off for a year. I mean, I think they're going to update it next year. I'm pretty sure some more strict requirements are coming. But, um, but So I hope that helps. This is really just a definition, which is why I say what to do about it is it's just don't call anything open data right now until they force you to publish things in that format. And then I think, did we have another question about a scanned PDF, or did you get to that one? Uh, that was that was also, uh, it was, how does it work? How one six nine work? Get a oh, got it. So part of that question was if you get a document from a third party that's possibly in a PDF or you have to scan to a PDF. So um, the thing about PDFs are that, um, first of all, they aren't going to be open data compliant by, by default because they're not technically machine readable, but they are searchable and indexable if they're text-based. So one of the things that I'm always telling my districts is don't go print your Word document, like your agenda, don't send it to the printer and then take it over and put it on the scanner to make a PDF. Make your PDF from within Word. And so if you do that, then it's searchable and it's indexable. Even on our platform, our search works and it looks inside of PDFs. But if you go scan it, the minute you do that, you've created an image, basically. And you know, then you have to go back and character recognize it, and that's just crazy. So um, it's just a good tip I probably should put in the presentation somewhere is to you know create those because I really don't suggest anybody ever put Word documents online, um, even protected ones. It's just not great form. So it's a good idea to turn things into a PDF, but um, do it from within your software. Makes the file size smaller too. Mac is pointing out. So, you know, I know that this is a challenge for some agencies because some of what goes in your agenda packet may be maps, right? And so, you know, they're going to be scanned images basically. So it's a little bit more work to create your, uh, you know, part of your packet from Word and then insert, you know, the pages that, that have to do with things like maps and visual things like that. Um, what I see coming is that they're going to make agendas machine readable in the near future. That is my guess. And I'm sorry, I'll just tell you ahead of time. Apologize, I think that's coming. So we're going to just, just see if there's any other questions. And for those of you who have said thank you, um, you're welcome. Thank you so much for spending your time here. I really appreciate it. One of the things I thought I could do, since we still have a few people on, I am going to just pull up my my Acnema demo site. And uh, I'm logged in, which is why you see this funny little red bar on the side, but I'm going to just zoom out a little bit. And I'll just drag this over. So this kind of simulates uh, mobile friendly. So if something is responsive, what will happen is when you start to squeeze it down, so you imagine you're getting onto something like a tablet, it starts to reformat the page. And then as you get down to the smallest, if this is, oh, this yeah. is appearing, okay. So you get down the smallest, like the smallest iPhone or what have you, Google Pixel, 
you can see that it just starts to put everything on top of itself, so on top of each other, so that you can easily get to all the homepage content. And then this is the hamburger menu that I was talking about. So I forgot I was going to show an example of this. So um, and then it just stacks your links on the top, and your search box is still available. So that's what responsive means. Oh, and we've got a question. We have a question from Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Uh, regarding the agenda packet, um, are you required to post anything for an upcoming board meeting other than the agenda? Nope. <laughs> nope. Luckily, no. Um, many agencies choose to, and you can. Um, we actually built in a special field in, in our platform because people wanted their agenda and their agenda packet separately. Um, but you do not have to. The only thing that's required is the agenda itself so far. I'm just poking around here now that we're just, we still have a few people sitting in here, and I don't even know if anybody's paying any attention. <laughs> you got 26 people still paying attention. Yeah, yeah. I always feel like people are just staying logged in because their computer's there, so I never know if I should just keep talking. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if you have any other questions, oh, you're very welcome, Becky. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Do you have to post the latest agenda from any public meeting or board meetings only? Um, they have lots of committee meetings. Oh, yeah, lots of committee meetings. So, yeah, um, so if we're talking about the Brown Act, so there's two different things. Hi, Mike, by the way, I'm waving at you. Um, if we're talking about the Brown Act, your committee meetings also have to be posted 72 hours in advance, just like your regular board. If we're talking about um, the what the heck is the number now I can't think the 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 most recent agenda on the home page if we're talking about that one no it is just your main governing body and I'll say again I like you know I hate that phrase being a dead horse um I have to come up with a better phrase than that that's not so violent but um again the reason that it's only your main governing body is because CSDA and CSAC and the league just fought like crazy against that because their point was, okay, if we have 15 committees and a board and we're a big city or whatever, our homepage is going to be nothing but agendas, which would be kind of silly. So um, so I hope that's clear. Mike, I hope that's clear. So for the most recent agenda on the homepage, it's just your main governing body. And then, uh, yeah, okay, good. For the Brown Act, it's, it's all your committees within 72 hours in advance. And we still have... 19 people sticking with us, so if you have questions, throw them in there because we're happy to stay. I have no idea why I like talking about this stuff so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Analia. Anil? No, that's it. Analia. What a nice name. Very, very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I know. Now you have to call me and tell me how to pronounce your name after this. <laughs> Anna Leah. Ah, that's okay. Now you don't have to call me. Anna Leah, that's awesome. All right, I'm just putting back my my slide for uh, streamline because we really do have your back. We love doing this, and we even like doing the calls. Oh, Susan, you're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, we'll send. What I typically do after these is I send not only the slides and the recording and everything else, but I usually type up the questions and answers too and just send those along so everybody has them right at their fingertips so you will get more information than you ever probably needed <laughs> as a follow-up after this. Thanks, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. And you're welcome, welcome. It's funny, I always feel like the bearer of bad news um, when I give this presentation, but it's not that hard. And uh, the handouts help. There's a, in fact, Matt created the little checklist that kind of sums it all up so that you can just make sure you're compliant with everything. And so um, that's helpful. It's a little less scary.
So I'm next watching the chat and I'm watching for questions if there's anything else that comes up in the next few minutes, please feel free to throw it in there. I think this is the first webinar I've done where people have used chat. Mm -hmm. At least I hope. And I didn't just miss it last time. <laughs> hmm. Something I guess I could point out from the slide that's up now, which I just realized by looking at it, it might look like the free SB272 compliance tool has something to do with our web tool and it doesn't, it's a standalone thing that anyone can use. And I know I mentioned that, but now when I'm looking at this list, it sounds like if you sign up for Streamline Web, you get all of these things, but that's, you don't have to sign up for Streamline Web to get the SB272 compliance tool. You can just go to our website and uh, sign up for that and start building your catalog. And it's not as hard as it seems. Um, our, our wizard is great in the sense that it just walks you through every little piece of the law and um, helps you determine what does need to be included and what can be excluded and helps you publish your catalog and it makes it all pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. The law is not very straightforward, but um, we worked really closely with a couple of attorneys that worked um, with CSDA when they were first kind of fighting this bill and so um, it, it doesn't have to be that hard. It could be a little confusing, but you can always reach out to us if you have questions or if there's anything we can do to help. Okay, we got three minutes to go, two and a half minutes to go. We're just going to stay here until right till three, just because in case something else comes up. And uh, feel free to stay with us or uh, sign off whenever you'd like. It looks like I think we were able to get to all the questions too, huh? Okay, good. All right, so we're just about out of time. I want to thank everybody again for spending your afternoon with us, um, especially on a Friday. I realized after I scheduled this, I was like, ah, who wants to listen to this on a Friday? But then I thought, well, maybe you could justify going home early at 3 if you had to sit through this kind of a talk. <laughs> it was like, oh, I should be able to leave at this point. So, well, thanks again for joining us be posting pre-holidays and uh, have a really great weekend. For those of you who are still here, I just got a great question from Rick. Thank you, Rick. Um, he had just asked if if um, you'll receive an opinion survey of the webinar, and you will. Um, we send follow-up surveys afterwards always to find out if it was helpful. 
and if they're if you got everything that you needed or well you'll see that's like three questions or something um, but please be honest and uh, please fill that out because it really helps us to create um, better presentations so that we can make good use of your time so thanks again and uh, have a great afternoon oh, thanks Jennifer thanks so much and um, all of you thank you for your time and have a great weekend okay bye everybody